Good afternoon. Uh, my name is James McAreevy and uh, I'm research and PR officer with uh, Newry Maritime Association. And uh, I'm joined today by Tommy O'Hanlon, uh, whose father, Terry, uh, was a merchant seaman and uh, a captain in the Merchant Navy. And um, Terry had a, a, a long career at sea and uh, then he actually finished up at uh, Victoria Locks, isn't that right, Tommy? As Lockmaster. As Lockmaster. And uh, he was there from 1951 to 1968. But uh, Terry, like a lot more Newry seamen, uh, commenced his career with the local firm of Joseph Fisher & Sons. And uh, he then went at one stage to Richard Hughes and Company in Liverpool. And there was one particular ship uh, that he he will always be remembered uh, as being a member of the crew, and that was the SS Dorian Rose. And uh, maybe you could tell us a bit, Tommy, about um, your late father's uh, involvement with the Dorian Rose. Well, my father's ship, the Dorian Rose, was commandeered during the war for the evacuation of Dunkirk. They made a number of trips back and forward. At one stage, a ship beside them had a direct hit. The ship was called the Queen of the Channel, and they came alongside her and took off about a thousand troops and made their way back to Dover. At the end of the day, the ship w was really done out, and the boilers were burst, and she was used as a sort of uh, blockade for the, at the mouth of Dover Harbour. Now, the man you mentioned, uh, obviously the the uh, the engineer uh, was very important, and uh, he too was a local man. Yes, the chief engineer was a man called Barney Murphy from Bally McDermott, and uh, he, along with my father, were awarded the DSC at Buckingham Palace. Now, the DSC, tell the viewers what that is. The DSC stands for the Distinguished Service Cross, which was presented to Merchant Navy people rather than people who were in the military. Yeah, it was, for, it was an award for uh, people like your father who were unarmed and non-combatants. That's, that's correct. Uh, they, they were there... Uh, as an aid to the civil power, and uh, like the service that they performed at Dunkirk, um, there was uh, two million troops uh, were were evacuated back to Britain, and in actual fact, the Dorian Rose was responsible for bringing back sixteen hundred men on a small coal boat that had a complement of thirteen men. That's correct. And every every member of the crew was decorated, and in actual fact, then they went off to Buckingham Palace, Tommy, uh, to get the uh, to get this award, isn't that right? Yes. And that would have been uh, King George the Sixth, would it? King George the Sixth, yes. Yeah. So um, we actually uh, have a have a close up of of, uh, of your father there as well, and um, I'm sure it was a very a very very proud moment. Um, did your father ever talk about that much, Tommy? He talked very little about the war. He just about said the experience. He just said it was. He was there, and it had to go on. And um, yeah, he he said war is a bad thing. He didn't like the war at all. And I noticed. I noticed from talking to um, and uh, talking to several of the old hands that uh, the 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 uh, it's a thing that they seem to 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 block out. Yes, I think Almost. they witnessed such hor horrific experiences that it just they wanted to blot it out. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Well, um, we have a, a, a lovely photograph, Tommy, uh, coming up next, uh, something that you would be very familiar with. And um, this, this picture is taken for the benefit of, of, of the viewers that are watching. Uh, this is taken down at Fadham. Uh, where the former Lobita soil tanks were and where just down below where Dan O'Hare runs a very successful 
uh, commercial truck repair business today. And um, it's obviously uh, the picture shows in the foreground as we look at it. Uh, that's the O'Hanlon homestead. And uh, maybe you could tell us a wee bit about your father's family, Tommy, because he wasn't the only seaman. No, he wasn't indeed. Uh, my uncle Paddy and my uncle Matt and uh, my uncle Jimmy were all at sea. Now, Jimmy died very young, but the other two men were, went on to be captains of ships and were worked for the uh, Westminster dredgers in mm -hmm. Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And uh, Paddy and his family settled in Liverpool. That yeah. ship in the photograph now is the Margaret Lockington. It's on its way to Newry with a load of coal. Now the the ship the ship if we could just uh, see that photograph for a second, um, the 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 Margaret Lockington, uh, a lot of the old seamen, uh, Mickey Fern in particular, talks about the Margaret Lockington, and he said that it was the fastest collier of its type on the Irish Sea. Yes, I, I heard that before. Uh, he <laughs> said that that on fisher ships. The Margaret Lockington, for instance, uh, when she cleared the Liverpool bar, she could open up an hour on the on the Newry steamers. Right. And um, in fact, uh, Captain Jack Taylor, uh, who was a long time uh, master, uh, he went to the St Coleman, didn't he? Yes, I remember Captain Taylor. Actually, he took us to uh, Garston when I was about eight or nine years old. And we we came back then on the Belfast boat, and obviously, obviously a, a lovely memory for you. Yes. Now the building, Tommy, uh, on 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 the to the right of the picture, uh, that old building, uh, that was a very very important part of the whole canal infrastructure, wasn't it? That was the original locks. It was called the Fortescue Lock. And I think there was also a post office in that building. Yeah. And then later on, they extended the canal down to what we know now as Victoria Locks. Yeah, well, in, um, in actual fact, the canal, as you quite rightly said, ended there uh, up until 1842. And so John Fortescue was the, was the architect. And then from 1842 until... Um, 1842 to 1850, uh, they built the last section down to Victoria Locks, and Victoria Locks was opened, as was the Albert Basin. Uh, so that's a, that was a it's a lovely picture. Now behind the O'Hanlon homestead, um, we have a railway line. Yes, that's the the Newry Dundalk Green Ore railway line. Yeah, which closed in the. Middle fifties. Now, do you remember that in operation, Tommy? Very vaguely. I don't really remember it saying. I remember men lifting the rails. You mean the the the, the actual track getting yes getting taken off? Yes, and I remember there was a man who gave me a little hammer. I was only about four or five, I suppose. And he gave me a little hammer, a wee fancy hammer, and I had it for a long time. It. Well, I mean. When when you look at that photograph today, uh, you know, and and um, another another thing that we should mention, Tommy, if we look past your family homestead, uh, we can just see a little white house, uh, just past that, and uh, they were neighbours of yours. Tell us about that family. They were the McParlins. Now they also went to sea, and Paddy McParlin, who was a good friend of my father's. He was decorated during the war as well. Yeah, he got the MBE. That's right. Paddy apparently was torpedoed three times. But he wasn't the only member of the McParland family uh, at sea. Uh, there were four brothers. And uh, in fact, uh, Jack McParland's son, John, uh, as you know, is a member in our group. And he, he too was a merchant Navy captain. And uh, I do keep John going about the fact that uh, although there were four members of the family were ship's captains, the O'Keefe's had five, isn't that right? <laughs> That's probably right. <laughs> you know, but uh, 
Sadly today, Tommy, uh, everything's gone in that picture. That's isn't right. It? Uh, your your house, you have a, you have a new house built yes. there uh -huh. today, but your your family home's gone. The Fortescue Lock House is gone. The Margaret Loggington was scrapped in 1958 in Dublin. Uh, the railway line, as you say, was closed and the track lifted. And the McParlins house has gone. And they actually ran the post office in that's, the latter years, right. didn't they? That's correct, yes. And tell me, um, am I correct in saying, did the postman actually leave and walk up through the wood to Fadham? Postman walked the whole way right round. I suppose he walked right down to the locks and maybe up through the wood. Yeah. Yeah. And, and along the yes, Flagstaff yes. Road. Oh, it was. Yeah. It was a long journey. So now we 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 have uh, our next image here. Obviously, is Victoria Locks as it would have been uh, in in the late nineteen thirties, and. Um, there's a, a, a pretty iconic picture here because uh, nothing has really changed there, Tommy, has it? Not a lot. The, the lock gates were built to last and the lock chamber was built to last and it's still there. And we've got two steamers uh, tied up here waiting to go and we can see on the seaward end uh, one has just departed. Yes, it was a busy, nearly was a busy port in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Now, um, tell us a bit about, uh, we said that um, uh, w when your father was at sea, we have, we, we have a couple of his books you've, you've brought in. Um, I see you've got his discharge book. Um, maybe you'd explain to us, um, you know, what, what this is and what these stamps mean. Well, when a... When a Seaman went to sea, he had to have a discharge book. It, it was nearly like a passport. Yeah. And when he was leaving that ship, uh, the name of the ship was written in by the captain and uh, remarks on whether his conduct was good or un unfavourable. A continuous certificate of discharge. That's what it was called. And yeah. then we've got, of course, um, the the the... Certificate of Competency, the Master Certificate. Master certificate. Now, now, this is obviously self-explanatory and it's like a driving licence really, Tommy, yes, isn't it? Yes, that's, that's correct. And, and it's, it's really a driving licence to say that you're competent to be in charge of a ship. To be a Master Mariner. A Master Mariner. Yeah. And uh, Terence O'Hanlon was one of those Master Mariners. And I see that... Um, he actually uh, got this in December 1932. That's correct. You know, um, and he had quite a long career. But I was going to ask you, Tommy, uh, when your father retired, uh, now the last company he was with was East Downshire. Yes. Tell us a wee bit about East Downshire. Well, East Downshire Company had two ships, the Germain and the Downshire, and they operated out of Dundrum and he would have been the captain and we lived in Dundrum in a house belonging to the East Downshire Company, a nice little house called the Bath House and it's still there today and if you were in Dundrum you'd see the house with the East Downshire Company's coat of arms on the gable of the house. And is that is that close to uh, the, the the port itself? Just Tell down me. near the harbour. Now it's right. all built up with uh, apartments today. And, and from the main road, you can see it. And Just, the, it's been behind a garage. And the company logo still. The company logos on the wall. I must look out. I must look out for that, Tommy. Uh, I've been down that way regular. My sister lives in Newcastle, and I must look out for it. But um, obviously, then. When your dad retired, uh, he obviously he was he was looking for alternative employment, and you did mention to me that he had toyed with the idea of a coast guard's job in Donegal. It was, uh, I think it was Bally Castle. Oh, Bally Castle. He, he, he fancied the, he was, and then the houses were very far away from the town, and my mother thought it would be very isolated. 
mm. and she didn't like it, so he turned that job down. And at that time, Tommy, as as we know, um, the lockmaster, uh, the lockmaster obviously was in charge of Victoria Locks. Uh, he was in charge of the day to day uh, operations and uh, looking after the men. Um, how many men were involved uh, in opening and closing the gates? There were four men. There were two men on each wench, two men on the each gate. At each gate. On so each side of the chamber. The chamber. And I remember there was uh, Larry Boyle from Omeath and Richie Boyle from Omeath. There was Barney Hollywood from Fathom. There was Podge Hollywood from Fathom. Barney, uh, Mickey Matthews from Fathom. And Mickey Matthews had a son. His son later on. His later son on. worked at it. And then, of course, we had men like uh, old Paddy Turley. Paddy Turley, yes. Who was a, an ex fishers man. Uh, he, he was actually on the mango. Uh, when it was wrecked uh, on right? the west coast of right, Ireland, right. Uh, and um, but when your father took over, that was in 1951, and he followed in the footsteps of a very famous lockmaster, a Captain James O'Neill. That's right. And he had been there for 50 years, from 1901, when Yuri Port and Harbour Trust took over. Uh, Captain O'Neill was the lockmaster. And uh, we know that he had two sons, uh, Jimmy and Paddy, and both were merchant navy captains. In fact, uh, Captain Paddy O'Neill was lost on the Walnut uh, when That's she right. sank yeah. uh, in October 1941. Now, when your father took over uh, in 1951, obviously there was a house there. Yes. I remember the house well. And my cousin Kathleen Smith talks fondly about coming uh, into Newry on the uh, MV Dundalk, which was the B&A cattle ship, and her father, Desi, a man you would remember well, Desi Keenan. was the last master. Yes. Uh, last Newry master on her. And she talks about, Kathleen talks about uh, stopping at the, going into the locks on a Sunday morning and your mother would come out and she said, Mrs. O'Hanlon would take us in and give us ice cream. Right. <laughs> and that was her last memory of the last That's very good, man. Sunday morning, your mother and the ice cream. That's very good. Yeah. You know, but what was life like growing up at the locks, Tommy? Life was very exciting because there was ships coming in all the time. I was always very interested in the foreign ships that came in. Yeah. They mostly came... Uh, in the spring from uh, Scandinavia. From the you'd Baltic. Be, you'd be looking at the different flags, mm. maybe Denmark or Norway. And I remember one from coming from Archangel. And yeah. I was talking about it in school, and there was great interest even from one of the Christian brothers. He, he was very interested in this ship coming all the way to Newry from Archangel. Yeah. And in fact, it harks back, Tommy, uh, to, the, to the real... Uh, Hallison days of Newry Port, uh, when ships came from all over the world. That's true. But even in the in the latter times, as you say, um, you know, in the in the the fifties uh, and sixties, we still had ships coming from Scandinavia with timber for hallands and for fishers, and uh, of course we had the uh, extensive coal trade. Yes. Then there were also <laughs> ships came with china clay for. The Wade factory had put it down. Yes. There was a little ship, the Normandy Hall, I think it it came with that. And then some of them came for O'Hare's Mills. Yes. With uh, grain. And then later on we had the oil tankers, like the Passa Balamaha came to, to the well, oil tankers. Well, just when you mention, uh, when you mention uh, Sands' Mill uh, and, and um, Frank Fisher, uh, who was the boss in Fisher's. Uh, from 1901 to 1951, he was married to one of uh, the daughters of the, the owner of the mill, Jane Sintler. And in fact, his son uh, was called James Sintler Fisher, J.S. Fisher. And Jim. is that how we have Sinclair Street now? That's at that Sink corner. I S never associated that. Sinclair's owned the mill, you see, 
It was built in 1873 by the Sinclair family and then Robert Sands bought it at a later stage. And at one stage he had the Newry Reporter. Uh, he, he, uh, he printed the Newry Reporter in, in the middle over there. But uh, that's, that's how the Sinclair family came to be linked into um, Fishers. And Jane Sinclair died uh, of tuberculosis around 1911 and Frank, Frank Fisher was a widower for almost 40 years right. and of course he lived at Drummond Lane Chapel. That's right, yes. Uh, you'd remember that Tommy? I don't remember, I remember it opening vaguely but I don't ever remember a house being there, there you know. Right. I wouldn't really, when you're young you don't take into in, interest in these things. You also, you also mentioned Tommy uh, something again that had a short lifespan in the port, but was very important. And that was the building of the uh, the oil terminal uh, just across the road from where you live today in 1957. And uh, it was there until the canal closed in 74. Uh, and what do you remember about it, Tommy? I remember Lebetis had it, first of all, and uh, they had all these big lorries. I remember the, these ships we'd never saw tankers before, the Pass of Balamaha and the Pass of Dramatra, I think. The Pass of Dramatra, uh, she, answered, she answered the distress call of the Princess Victoria. That was in? In 1953. That was which, actually on my birthday, the 31st of January. Is that right? That's right. And that was uh, one of the worst shipping disasters, uh, it, it, it eclipsed the, uh, our own tragedy in Carlingford Lock with the Connemara, Connemara and the, and the Retriever. The retriever. Yeah. So um, obviously uh, a lot of local people, Tommy, probably worked there. I know Paddy O'Hare worked uh, yeah, so in the terminal. Yes, a lot terminal. of local people were, got, had jobs driving and there was office staff. Mm. And then later on Burma Oil took it over. Right. And uh, I think in the 70s there was an attempt to blow it up. That's right. Yeah. Well, in fact, um, you as a young boy uh, had, had a, a particularly harrowing experience uh, back in, uh, it would have been 1957, 1957 I think. 1957, that's correct. And what, what happened that night, Tommy? Well, that night uh, a group... I don't know, I suppose they were IRA, came to blow up the lock gates and uh, they burst in the front door of our house and they put us out. We didn't even have time to put on shoes. I <coughs> just marched down the road with my mother and father in our bare feet and uh, they said lie down on the road and uh, they headed off south in a van and then the next thing there was a loud bang and the uh, sea gates were blown off their hinges. And uh, I think the locks must have been out of operation for about two years. So there was a big job, Mac McLaughlin and Harvey's from Belfast worked there and there was a big, big repair job on it. Mm -hmm. And and the, this coal had to come into Warren Point that time. Yeah, yeah. And obviously uh, there, was a, there was a lot of, uh, there was a big compensation uh, case there, but it was more, it was more the loss of trade really, wasn't it? Uh, so um, now today, uh, of course your father left in 1968. That's right. And uh, you moved up then to where you're living today? No, we lived in, uh, in Carve Crescent. Right. Dublin Road. Right. And uh, now we see today uh, the locks as it is. The, the the actual lock chamber hasn't changed at all, no, has it? it hasn't. No. I mean, that, that that picture could have been taken uh, 50, 60 years ago. Yes. It's just those railings and bollards around. And it's been, all, it, it's been automated since yes, oh, it's 2007. Been, that's right. Uh, the, day, the days of Podge Hollywood and the the wine and handle yeah, are gone. gone. Yeah, you know, just as a matter of interest, Tommy, uh, how long did the procedure take to 
uh, when a vessel entered the, into the lock chamber, uh, say from the seaward end, coming in from Charlingford Lock, uh, and to raise the water to get into the I would the say it took the best part of an hour. Yeah. With everything that was going on. Sometimes uh, they were able to have a late lock or an early lock, depending on the state the of the spring, tide. spring tide. Yeah. And if there were t smaller vessels, sometimes they could double up and have two, two in the chamber so, at so, once. So, Tommy, um, in conclusion, uh, happy days growing up, happy childhood memories. Absolutely. A lot of variety, a lot of contact with lots of seagoing people. Yeah. Happy days, as you say. And, and it must have been really, really interesting uh, I'd imagine that uh, you had a lot of tales to tell in school. We heard a lot. Of, had a lot of stories, all right. And you were never short of coal. No, we were never short of coal. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tommy, thanks very, very much. I enjoyed it. Thank I you, hope, James. I hope that everyone else enjoyed it as much as uh, myself and Tommy. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>